And we are live. A warm welcome to all of you joining us this fantastic occasion celebrating the Nobel Prize in Physics 2023. My name is Louise Pierce and I have the honor of guiding you through this afternoon. And to all of you joining us remotely, I can inform you that I'm standing in front of a full auditorium. Can we hear the clapping? <laughs> However, you are not the only ones being here in this building celebrating our Nobel laureates. No, 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 you're not. Over to Gasksalen. Marina, you're also in the building with one of some of your closest friends, right? How yes, is the right. atmosphere in Gasksalen? The atmosphere in Gasksalen is truly amazing. We are waiting for the Nobel lectures and this festive ambience that comes with this special occasion. Isn't that right, Gasksalen? Thank you, Marina. Uh, but that is not all. Let's go to Hörsalen. Natalia, how is it going in Hörsalen? Hello, everyone. It's going absolutely amazing. We're so excited. <laughs> that is fantastic. I can see that the battle is going on now in the different rooms. Before I hand over to the next speaker, I would like to inform you that there will be rooms for question after Anne's lecture. And we will do that through Menti. No microphones will be sent around in the rooms. So if you have a, an intriguing question that you would like to post, please go to menti.com, enter the code 12692186. And state your question. One, two, six, nine, two, one, eight, six. Crystal clear. And with that being said, I hand over to Annika Olsen, the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering. Thank you so much, Lulu, uh, and thank you all for coming here uh, for this specific or special day to our faculty. Uh, welcome to all here in the room and in the other two rooms that we saw from here. Uh, we are here today to celebrate the Nobel Prize in Physics 2023. Uh, to us at Lund University, and specifically the Faculty of Engineering, the prize of 2023 is, of course, very special. Uh, and that's uh, due to that one of the laureates is our professor, Anne Hullier. Uh, the three Nobel Prize winners of 2023 20, in physics, Professor Augustini from the U Ohio State University, uh, Professor Ferenc Krauts from Max Planck Institute and Professor Anne Hullier from Lund University. All made impressive research breakthroughs uh, and have been do working with that for long. All of them have been passionate and persistent in their research, of course in times of success but even in times of doubt, the persistence has been there. And I think that is a basic ground for them being so successful in the end. Uh, we are very proud of having a world leading infrastructure at Lund Laser Center. And I see the front row here <laughs> representing um, people from there. Uh, an infrastructure that has continuously developed since it once attracted Anne Hullier to Lund, actually, with her bus from Paris, <laughs> as I heard of. Uh, and thanks to Anne and the 
the research and the education environment. The environment around this infrastructure has developed in a very, very positive way. And it's, of course, very important to us, both with a research uh, environment, but also with an uh, educational environment that I know that Ann has a specific heart in, the, the place for education in this area. So today we are celebrating the Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, and all three laureates that I mentioned before. Unfortunately, uh, Professor Agustini can't be here today uh, as planned, but Anne, you have been kind to and promised us that you will tell a little about his uh, research as well that was planned to be presented here today. And tomorrow, Professor Krauss will visit the Department of Physics as, and have a lecture there. So we have all three in mind today, even if they couldn't be just in this room. So once again, uh, I welcome you all here and I really look forward to uh, listen to Anne. So welcome up to present your research to us. Uh, Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I gave a lecture in Uppsala a few days ago and I said, wow, this aula in Uppsala was fantastic. This was in the big uh, university house in Uppsala. Uh, th this is not maybe the nicest aula here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the most fantastic public. So impressive. And this is the best students. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to uh, try to explain to you why I got a Nobel Prize in Physics. Um, so uh, this is a kind of a history of the field. Um, so I'm going to tell you about research that was done uh, 36 years ago and even before actually. So a long time ago. And um, so I will mostly talk about part one and two, which is the beginning and uh, the progress. I will mention a little bit part three, which is measurement of atosegan pulses, especially since Pierre Agostini could not come. But I will not say too much about, uh, of course, what Fair and Cross uh, will tell us tomorrow. So uh, for those who are interested to know more, especially about applications, I, uh, I uh, encourage you to... Uh, so what should I do? Okay, it's 15, 15, zero, zero. Okay, at uh, Physics Department, Ridberg Lecture Hall. Okay, so uh, <coughs> I start actually uh, 1960 which is the invention of the laser. Nothing of what I'm going to say today would have happened without the invention of the laser in 1960 by Theodor Meinmann. Nobel Prize for laser went to actually the background behind the laser by, by Towns, Basov and Prokhorov. And you have here a picture of uh, one of the first lasers, it was a ruby laser. And we are going to use two properties of the laser. Um, the fact that you can confine light into short pulses, and especially the fact that when you focus the, the laser light with the lens, you can get very intense radiation. So immediately after the invention of the laser, 1961, a new field of research was born, which is called nonlinear optics. And you have here the, the first experiment where a ruby laser is uh, focused by a lens, you can see, and in a, in a piece of uh, quartz. And out of this come not only the laser light, but also the second harmonic of the laser light. So uh, you, here it's a prism which is used to analyze the radiation, to disperse the radiation. And actually what I'm going to show you in this uh, talk it looks very much the same. A laser, focusing lens, a medium, and then a detector. So um, in this process, what happens is that the material 
absorb two photons, which are in red, and then a new frequency, with, with a, uh, which is twice the laser frequency is created. This is the second harmonic. Another field was uh, born approximately at the same time, after the invention of the laser. <coughs> and this is the field of uh, atoms in strong laser fields, especially multi-photon processes. And you have here one example of a two-photon process where an atom is excited to an excited state by absorbing two photons. And these uh, processes were actually predicted already in 1934 by Maria Gopak Maya. <coughs> So we can have two-photon or multi-photon absorption. We can also have multi-photon ionization, as you see in this process. Here, the atom absorbs four photons and then is ionized. In 1979, Pierre Agostini uh, discovered the phenomenon of above threshold ionization, where an atom absorbs actually more photons that what is needed for ionization, and this result in, uh, in actually electrons that have a higher kinetic energy. A few years later, uh, now this was my thesis work in the beginning of the 80s, it was also observed that an atom could absorb actually many photons and uh, be multiply ionized. And there came the idea Oh, but uh, if we can uh, do all of this, probably in this process we create uh, atoms which are excited or ions which are excited, and maybe they can de-excite by emitting photons, by emitting fluorescence. So let's look at fluorescence. And this is what we tried to, to do. Uh, so this was in uh, 87. At, in France, at the Commissariat Energie Atomique, south of Paris. So we set up an experiment where we sent an intense laser pulse into a gas of atom, and we looked at the radiation. Radiation in, in several directions, fluorescence is emitted in all directions, so we had actually a two uh, uh, detection uh, uh, directions, one along the laser uh, direction and one perpendicular to it. And we analyze the radiation with a grating, it's like a prism, and then we have a detector. This is how the laser looked like at that time. It was a picosecond laser. In the middle you have um, <coughs> an oscillator and then amplifier. And this is a picture of the, the experiment. The laser is coming from the right. There is a lens and uh, everything is in vacuum. There is a, a small gas jet which is uh, giving this uh, medium, gaseous medium, and then we look both perpendicular to the laser propagation direction and in the same direction using a grating and a detector. I, am, I have been told not to uh, use any laser pointer and it's a little bit difficult not to do that. <laughs> but I, I hope you can, uh, you can follow what I'm saying. Um, <coughs> So we never saw anything actually along the perpendicular direction, so I'm not going to talk about it. And we actually didn't see uh, fluorescence light, or very little, but we saw something else. And what we saw was high order harmonics of the laser field, and this was the discovery, and this is the uh, uh, main reason why I got the Nobel Prize. So this was 36 years ago, <laughs> so one has to be a little bit patient in life. <laughs> But uh, the, anything can happen. But anyway, this is what we saw. We saw uh, very high orders uh, of the laser radiation. You have an example of spectrum obtained in argon. And when it says 13, 15, 17, that means that the frequency is equal to 13 times the laser frequency. So really high orders of the laser field. If we plot, the intensity of these uh, peaks as a function of order, we obtain this uh, characteristic distribution with uh, a plateau and, and a cutoff. And this was really not expected. It was not expected to see as high orders. And it was certainly not expected to see this plateau behavior. 
Why not? Because at that time we were thinking in terms of uh, perturbation theory, which means a perturbative expansion. So we would like to express the polarization in the medium as, as a sum of uh, different uh, orders. And of course, for this expansion to be valid, you need the, the first term to be much larger than the third, to be much larger than the fifth, etc. And this was obviously not the case because of this plateau behavior. Now you can notice that uh, I'm only talking about uh, odd order harmonics, and that is due to the symmetry of the interaction. It's a gas, there is an inversion symmetry, and this kills the even order harmonics. So when you go from uh, a laser which is in the near infrared region, to uh, let's say the 33 harmonic, then you end up into the extreme ultraviolet region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's below X-rays, but above ultraviolet. It's uh, a radiation which does not propagate in, in air. And so we need to work in, in vacuum chambers. Now, just to make a little analogy, when you hear about harmonics, you probably think about music. There was a very nice orchestra welcoming us today. <laughs> so, uh, uh, in music, uh, the concept of uh, overtones is, is well known. And actually, the number of overtones you have when you play a music instrument determines the, the, the clang, the timbre of a music instrument. You have an example here of a spectrum uh, obtained when you uh, uh, play the uh, a note a tone of the violin, and this is looking a little bit like uh, our spectrum of high order harmonics. So you can think that uh, our gas of atom is a violin, and uh, the the bow of the violin is is the laser pulse. But of course, we talk about harmonics of light and not harmonics of sound. Now, to uh, understand this process, you need to do uh, two things. You need to understand the single atom response, which is uh, how the atom interacts with the uh, laser field. So, uh, um, the atom needs to generate all of these harmonics. This is uh, quantum mechanics. It's described by the Schrodinger equation that you see here. It's the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, and you have here in this uh, right term, the atomic potential and then the laser atom interaction in the dipole approximation. Now, you also need, and I think to me this is what makes this uh, process so interesting, you also need to describe the response of the whole medium to the interaction in order to have uh, efficiently emission of uh, high order harmonics, you need all of the atoms to, uh, to emit in the same direction and in phase together. And this is described by Maxwell's equation of electromagnetism, which can be simplified to a wave equation. You have an example here. It's a wave equation with, in the second number, the polarization of the medium due to the interaction. So we need to solve uh, both equations. If I continue the analogy with music, you can think that now we have a big orchestra with uh, uh, many musicians. These are the atoms in the interaction medium, and all of these musicians need to play together. And uh, the number of musicians is actually much more than on in this picture. It's trillions of atoms. It's much more than the number of people on Earth. They need to play music together. So the first attempt to understand uh, this process was actually to solve the two equations that I show here. And uh, this is the result obtained in 89, showing uh, just uh, looking at the single atom response and uh, finding a relatively good agreement between uh, experiment and theory. In itself, this was a surprise because it was expected that uh, phase matching would actually be more and more difficult as the order of the process increases. But it seemed that this looks like already like the experiment. 
So it was also necessary to uh, solve the Maxwell's equation, the wave equation, and you have here a result showing approximately the same plateau behavior as, as in ex experiment. You see here a number of results for different laser intensities. Okay, we can simulate the uh, experiment. Does it mean that we understand it? Mm, not so clear. <laughs> so, uh, and then at the same time, we are in the beginning of the 90s, arise the question. Can we have at a second pulses? And let me explain very simply uh, this idea. So I'm plotting here three different waves with frequency 17, uh, the laser frequency, 19, 21. And now let's assume that all of these waves are in phase at the same time. We call, we took, we call this phase locking. Okay, if they are in phase at the same time, they will be in phase at the same time again a little bit later. The periodicity of the process is half the laser cycle, so every half the laser cycle. And now let's sum up these three waves. You can do that in your head. And what do we get? Well, you see that when these harmonics are in phase, they add constructively. We have constructive interference. When they are not in phase, they add destructively. So what we see is actually a, a series of pulses, which are very, very short. If we plot not only the electric field by the intensity, we obtain a, a series, we talk about a train of very short light pulses of the order of 100 at a second. So one at a second is 10 to minus 18 seconds. <coughs> Now, this is for three harmonics. Of course, you can do the same for 10 harmonics and you will get shorter and shorter pulses. So, uh, at the end of the... Uh, uh, so, so, yes. So, why is this interesting? It's interesting because at this time, there was uh, the, the uh, progress in uh, pulse duration of lasers had come to a stop. This is the evolution of pulse duration of lasers using dye lasers at the end of the 1900. And you see that it goes down, but no more than a few femtoseconds. And a little bit later, titanium sapphire laser, I'm going to discuss that in a moment, but same story, you can decrease the pulse duration, but no more than two femtoseconds. Why is that? The reason is that you cannot go below what is the uh, duration of one optical cycle. And, and one optical cycle of titanium sapphire is 2.6 femtoseconds. So uh, the uh, duration of the cycle makes it impossible to go below, below a few femtoseconds. So do try to go below when it's higher frequency. The second re reason, the second uh, condition to get very short light pulses is that you need a broad bandwidth. This is just an expression of Heisenberg principle. You need a broad bandwidth to make short pulses. So uh, this is why the, uh, to use the high order harmonics to uh, make very short light pulse sounded very exciting and very attractive because the high harmonics had both the high frequency, we are in the extreme ultraviolet range, and the broad bandwidth with all the harmonics. But the question was, are the harmonics phase locked? Are they in phase at the same time? So this is where we are at the end of the uh, 80s. We have discovered a new phenomenon. We can simulate it, but we don't really understand it. It's not really the same. And then we have an idea. Oh, is it possible that we have at the same time at two second pulses. So now I'm coming to part two, progress in technology and in understanding. I'm beginning by the progress in laser technology. So uh, at the beginning of the 90s, there's really three novelties in laser technology. The first one is chirp pulse amplification, which is the way to amplify short pulses without damaging the material. 
and this led to a Nobel Prize to uh, Gérard Moreau and Donna Strickland in 2018. There was a new material, titanium sapphire, uh, which was discovered by Peter Moulton in, in 86. And then a new way to generate short laser pulses called Kerlam's mode locking. And here you have three uh, Swedish scientists who are, well, all of them, at least two of them sitting here. <laughs> Sunes van Berg, Anders Persson, and Klaus Jaron Wallström that looked at this new laser technology and said, hmm, maybe it's time to uh, invest into, uh, into lasers in uh, Lund. And, uh, oh, maybe we take a little risk and, uh, and try this new technology. So uh, probably it was a tough decision, but they really decided to invest in this new technology. And uh, thanks to uh, funding from the Wallenberg uh, Foundation, and uh, and started a new facility, uh, and and with in particular a very nice terawatt titanium sapphire laser at the Lund Laser Center. And this laser was uh, really completely unique at that time, and it was the best laser to do high order harmonic generation with a pulse duration which was in the order of 100 femtoseconds and a repetition rate of 10 hertz, 10 laser shots per second, which was uh, extraordinary at that time. So what, well, where was that at that time? I was in France still, and I was actually building dedicated instrumentation to study uh, high order harmonic generation. And you have uh, one of these instruments with, uh, uh, you have the uh, explanation at the top. What, uh, this is myself, many years ago, and uh, with my uh, two first uh, students in France, Philippe Balcou and Pascal Salier. And uh, you see in this instrument, we have a gas jet, we have optics to analyze the radiation, and then we have a, a detector. This is also the time, I want to say that, I forgot to say that uh, at the beginning, when we saw the first high order harmonics, we uh, were using, uh, there was no computers in the laboratory. We were taking data by hand, and at that time we were actually using a printer to, uh, which was connected to the detector. So we have a printer that was following, and see one harmonic, next harmonic. This was a, uh, how it was done at that time. But now, in 92, the personal computers came in the laboratory, looking like this thing here with floppy disk, and uh, it really changed everything, because now we could really take data and uh, make programs to, uh, to uh, plot something as a function of something else, and really make use of this uh, repetition rate of the laser. So this was a, a huge uh, progress as well. So what happened then? Well, uh, Klaus Jorand Wallström uh, asked me whether I would like to come and uh, do experiments with a new, new laser system. And I say, of course, yes. <laughs> and uh, so we, we uh, it's not that I came with a bus, <laughs> but uh, I actually I came with my own uh, 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 car, Renault 5. And, uh, <laughs> with my students, and we put this machine into, uh, into a truck uh, towards uh, uh, Sweden. Then I, I stayed, but it's a different reason. I actually came back two years later. So what did we, did we see? Well, I just want to show first a, a spectrum from uh, a group in, uh, in Stanford uh, with a similar laser. I want to show that because this spectrum is beautiful. You can see here many, many harmonics, down to the 111th harmonic. This is obtained in neon gas. And, and uh, what you see at the beginning, like, like an increase, actually it's simply that the efficiency of the grating is, is, is decreasing. But you should imagine a very long, very long plateau, and then decrease towards 100th harmonics. And this is a, a result we obtained in Lund, collaboration between uh, Lund and Saclay. And, and here what we do is uh, um, we study harmonic generation as a function of intensity. And, and we, so now for the first time we are able to study 
the variation of these harmonics with the different parameters of, of the interaction, thanks to this laser with high repetition rate and, and to this possibility to use uh, computers in the laboratory. Okay, progress in understanding. A huge progress in the, uh, uh, in the theoretical understanding, uh, actually giving us an intuitive picture of what is going on. And this was done by theorists that you see on the right approximately at the same time. And this intuitive picture is called the three-step model. So first I'm going to explain to you what this picture is and then I will present to you uh, an analogy. Um, so what you see here is uh, the atomic potential in, in, in brown, but this atomic potential usually it looks like this, and, and now it looks like this. That's because of the laser field that kind of uh, bent this potential very strongly, so you have to remember it's a strong laser field. And then it, it makes it possible for an electron in the ground state to tunnel through the the, the potential barrier. And then this electron is driven away by the laser field. It's like classical mechanic. But then the laser field change of sign and the electron is driven back towards the atom and then there is a certain uh, probability for recombination leading at the same time to the emission of a short light pulse. You have to remember that this is a quantum mechanics, so this is actually an interference between uh, the wave function which is driven away and coming back and uh, what is left in the ground state. Now I can present to you a little bit analogy to that. Um, and this is called, uh, in Swedish, <laughs> um, an electron adventure in a laser field. And uh, here you have a representation of an electron and then there is a strong laser field. And you can picture it like this. We have a poor electron which is in prison. This is a strong electromagnetic force. And on the side there is an amusement park. It's a roller coaster that you see here. So the electron is, is really wondering, mm, I would like to have fun and to go out. What shall I do? Come on. <laughs> Take a tunnel. Take a tunnel, yes, of course. Tunnel. <laughs> it's my own drawings. <laughs> uh, okay. Then the laser, the electron is free and has fun and is going up and down. And uh, yes, he gets uh, accelerated. And yeah, this is a story that ends up very badly, unfortunately. <laughs> I guess you can guess. Yes. <laughs> On its way, <laughs> the electron uh, falls into uh, the open uh, prison. And uh, when it falls, its, uh, its excess energy is, is screams out his disappointment or whatever. And uh, that's end of the story. <laughs> okay, uh, now I'm, co I'm coming back to the at a second question. Now we can uh, study high order harmonic generation much better. We have an intuitive uh, understanding of the of the process, at least the single atom uh, response part of the process, what happens to the atosecond idea? And I, just to, to remind you, what we would like to have is uh, the fact that the phase are all the same. We have phase load harmonics. In the time domain, this is a series of atosecond pulses as shown here, one pulse per half cycle. Now we, let's calculate this using the new theories, and this is what we get. A mess. This is showing that when you start to understand things, well, maybe things get a little bit more complicated than you think. It's a mess. You have light everywhere. Uh, you have mostly two peaks. And actually, this is completely understandable using this uh, trajectory concept. If uh, you look at the possible trajectories, 
uh, that are possible, then you find that uh, there are trajectories which are called short, where the electron is driven away, come back very, very quickly. And you have also trajectories where the electron is driven away longer, come back after a longer time. I'm talking about nanometer excursion. It's a kind of large excursion. And they come back at the same energy and not at the same time, leading to this multiple, uh, multiple uh, um, peaks structure. So um, if you plot the phases of the different harmonics, this is what you get, complete mess. So the phases uh, which are varying between uh, 0 and 2 pi, except in the cutoff region where there is no photons anyway. So um, that's... Uh, mm. We understand better, but uh, this very nice at a second idea seems to be, uh, um, well, gone. So what do you do? Well, you continue working. You don't give up. And uh, we continue working and we look at uh, harmonics in many ways. And uh, this is an experiment which were done at the, now we are end of the 90s, with Mete Gordy, Ted Hunch. Marco Bellini, myself, and, and others. Uh, and here we look at uh, the coherence of uh, the harmonic. And how do you look at coherence of light? Well, you, you, you duplicate the source, and then you, you just look in the far field. If you do that with two, uh, uh, two lumps which are here, you look in the far field, what do you get? Nothing. But if the light is coherent, then you will get interferences. And this was, uh, of course, we thought that this light was coherent, but it's always nice to, to check. And uh, this is uh, the experiment. Uh, you see this picture showing the beam of harmonic 15s. You see beautiful interferences. I hope you can see them. Nice, this is coherent light, but you see also that there are two regions there is a, a collimated beam in the middle, and there is a more divergent beam in, in the middle. And this was the first really experimental evidence of the existence of these two families of trajectories, which I have uh, presented. So here, the, the collimated beam is due to this short trajectory, while this divergent beam is due to the long trajectory. We can also delay one of the, of the sources and uh, look at what happens to the interference fringes. And here we delay by 15 femtoseconds, and we see that, well, you still have interferences in the middle, but they are gone outside. So this shows that these uh, two families of trajectories, they have different properties, and they have different coherence time. This also gives ideas. Oh, but uh, maybe these two trajectories behave a bit differently. For example, a simple way to get rid of one of them would be to, uh, to put an aperture and to uh, remove one of the contribution. So this is where this, oh, do we have at a second pulses? We don't if we have these two trajectories, but maybe we could, uh, uh, well, try to control a little bit the harmonic emission. And this is also the time where we also progress in understanding the, the second aspect of the problem, which I call strong field nonlinear optics. And let me just go through it very quickly. To have uh, face matching, to have all of these musicians play together, we need uh, the uh, polarization in the medium and the field which is generated to propagate in phase. So that means that we need the with a vector mismatch between the two to be equal to zero. And this wave vector mismatch depends on uh, three different quantities. The dispersion of the medium, which includes, uh, due to the, the, both the neutral atoms and the free electrons, which are in the medium, laser focusing. And also, that's interesting part, the electron trajectory, this is related to the phase which is accumulated by the electron on its trajectory, so it comes there. So you see that to realize delta k equals zero, this depends 
on which trajectory. So maybe it's possible to have face matching only from one family of this trajectory and not both of them. And indeed, this is what we could calculate. In some conditions, we could actually uh, simplify this uh, temporal emission to only one pulse per half cycle, which means that we recover here phase-locked harmonics. So now we are at the end of the 90s. Uh, we understand much better both parts of the problem. The uh, atosigon idea is a little bit controversial. Myself, I was actually quite skeptical during many years. Um, at the beginning, yes, would be fantastic. Oh, but no, it's too complicated. Oh, but maybe we can control part of it and, and maybe get uh, phase-locked harmonics and consequently atosigon light pulses. So this is why the measurement of atosigon light pulse was so important. However, it was not clear at all how to measure atosigand pulses. And now I'm coming to uh, the third part of this talk. And uh, now I'm really borrowing um, um, some slides from Pierre Agostini. We had a contact uh, during the weekend. And I'm going to try to explain the experiment that he has done and how to measure these atosigon pulses. I want to say that it was not clear at all the, the which, how to do that. How can you measure something which is the shortest ever done on, on Earth? So what kind of detector can you use? So uh, the method which is uh, done is called interferometry, and it consists in actually measuring the phases of these high-order harmonics. There is a second method which is, uh, has been proposed by Fair and Cross, which I'm not going to describe. If you are interested, you, you can come to the lecture tomorrow. So what is the idea? The technique is called RAPID, like uh, reconstruction of uh, atosig and beating by uh, uh, interference of two photon transition. So I'm going back to the beginning of this talk, which is uh, multi-photon processes and multi-photon ionization. Here I'm looking at multi-photon ionization by absorbing two photons. One big, which is a harmonic photon, and then one small, which is a laser photon. Remember that Piero Gestini was a discoverer of this above threshold ionization, and he was really a specialist of uh, photoelectron spectroscopy. So it's not, it's not a surprise that he managed to do this experiment first. So if you uh, um, do photoelectron spectroscopy, what you will get, you will get a peak at the blue peak here, corresponding to absorption of these harmonics, and a red peak corresponding to these two photon processes. Now, you can also uh, absorb the next harmonic, and remember, it's only odd harmonics, so uh, they are separated by uh, number two. So you can absorb the next harmonic, and then you can have stimulated emission back to the same state. You get one more peak in your photoelectron spectrum, but now we have a, a state which can be reached by two paths. Okay, so now we have, again, this peak is called sideband. So now we have a state which can be reached by two quantum paths. We are doing quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, we add, this is like optics, if you want. We are going to add the amplitude, not the intensities, but the amplitude of one path and the second path. So if you look at the sideband, this sideband is, is proportional to the sum of the amplitude of these two paths square. Now, we sum two amplitudes. So what matters now is the phases of the amplitudes. So what are the phases of these two amplitudes? Well, the first, first we have the phases of the harmonics, which is what I want to determine. But you have also the phase of this uh, uh, infrared laser field. And since there is a delay between uh, the uh, harmonics and this uh, laser field, there is a phase which is simply equal to omega tau, and then for the photon coming down, it's minus omega tau. 
so that in the end, your signal, what you get is an interference uh, signal, which depends on the phase difference between the two paths, and you have omega 2 plus phi q, and then you have minus, minus omega tau minus phi q plus tau, so you have an, an interference equation that looks like this. Okay, so now you see that uh, through, if I do this experiment here and uh, vary the delay, I will see an oscillation. And from the position of the maxima, I can determine this phase difference between consecutive harmonics. I can get some information on whether these harmonics are phase locked or not. So how can one realize this? First, I'm going to show you how we do it every day in Lund. I think it's easier to understand uh, uh, first. And then I will show you uh, Pierre Agostini's setup, which was very, very clever. So this is how we do it in Lund. We use what is called a Maxander interferometer, where we split the laser in two arms, a point arm where we generate uh, high order harmonics or at a second pulse train. Actually, we don't know it's an at a second pulse train yet. <laughs> okay. This is what we say now. But we generate some high order harmonics and then we remove this uh, pump field. And then we have a probe arm, which uh, we have a vari variable delay. And then we focus uh, both of this radiation into an electron spectrometer and we detect the electrons. Now let's look just, uh, so this is the pump arm and the probe arm. Now Pierre Agostini designed uh, uh, online setup where he, he has both the pump and the probe in the same direction. So it's a very clever setup based on the delay plates. And there is a probe arm, which is the central beam. So the two beams are separated by a mask. He has a central beam, which is going through the, the plates and then uh, just going through into the second argon gas that you see. And you have the, the pump beam, which is outside, which is going through the first delay plate. And uh, it's being focused, generate high order harmonics, and then uh, continued, and then uh, creating electrons. And now he was varying the delay by varying the rotating these delay plates, actually both of them. Um, what was very nice, and this is something we realized afterwards, was that actually because of this uh, clever design with the delay plates and the mask, he had an aperture that you see on the other side. And what this aperture was doing was also to cut this divergent um, long trajectory contribution, if you remember. So. Uh, it was a little bit of luck. I don't think he understood what this aperture was doing, but it was probably cleaning this harmonic emission from this second uh, family of trajectories. So, um, yes. And this is the results with the first measurement of uh, harmonic amplitudes and phases. Uh, what you see uh, with uh, uh, colored circles, these are the sidebands, and what is on the right is the oscillation of these sidebands, and uh, from these uh, measurements, it could determine the, the phases of the harmonics that you can see here. So they are not flat, it's not that they are all in phase at the same time, there is a variation, but they are not random. And this was the important thing. And this is really why, he, this, in this experiment, he got the Nobel Prize for. Now, I can tell you that uh, he has been working on, on this during three, four years. There was a theoretical article where it was predicted that if you could do this, realize this experiment, in, if you could see oscillations, then you could deduce the phase difference between harmonics. So he was working now three or four years trying to see oscillation, and finally he saw it. Again, it shows that perseverance is the key. 
So uh, he could measure the phase and then uh, show that uh, this means that uh, um, these high harmonics constitute in the time domain a train of uh, short light pulses in the attosecond range. What Ferenc Cross did then, I'm not going to say uh, anything about it, but he could actually um, generate only a single attosecond pulse and use them for application. So uh, now I'm coming to the last part. Um, what I would like to do is um, very, very quickly uh, give you a glimpse of uh, what we use this radiation for. And I will not uh, go in depth at all, just give you a few ideas. And I will show two examples, one very fundamental and one much more applied. Very fundamental is what we try to do to uh, really measure uh, uh, dynamics of electrons. And here is the dynamics of uh, photoionization. Uh, what is an, really what we can do with attosecond parts is that we, we can uh, uh, look at electron processes. This is the same time scale. And here we look at uh, photoionization, which was uh, explained by uh, Einstein in 1905. And we can really try to ask and answer question like how, lo how long time does it take for an electron to propagate in the potential? And what are the wave or even quantum properties of the photoelectron? And I'm not going to explain to you how we do that. I just show an example here, which is uh, actually a rabbit spectrum obtained in neon. You see what kind of precision we can do these measurements nowadays. And here what we do is we compare 2S ionization, so ionization of neon in the 2S uh, subshell and ionization of neon in the 2P subshell. And you can again do a little analogy with music. Uh, when you have a um, or a conductor uh, deciding on, on time, on pace, is making a wave motion. Same time with a metronome, the tip of a metronome is making a, ma a wave motion. And here, the same thing, the temporal information we deduce from, from a wave measurement, from an oscillation, is here from the position of the uh, uh, maxima and minima of the oscillation that you see on this spectrum. And uh, we can also talk about a clock. Uh, in, in, uh, in our measurements, a clock is given by uh, a half laser cycle, which is 1,300 attosecond. And we can measure small differences between two arrows on this clock. We, can, we do not know where the two arrows are, but we can know the differences. And uh, this is a measurement where we can measure the difference in 2S and 2P ionization using this type of technique. Um, the other example I want to give is um, uh, much more applied, so much more towards engineering and actually already in industry, and this is why I mention it and is to use this, uh, not so much the attosecond pulse structure of the high harmonics, but the broadband and coherence of the high harmonics and in the extreme ultraviolet range. And now the, this source is used to uh, control uh, wafers, silicon wafers and integrated circuits on silicon wafers, especially in 3D dimension, as you see here. And now this is uh, being... Um, uh, moved by, uh, by companies, for example, the company ASML, which uh, use the radiation to control the wafer. This is for the next generation instruments working at the level of 10 nanometers. So it's not yet on the market, I don't think, but it's in the way to, uh, for the next generation uh, uh, integrated circuits. Now, uh, I think I would like to stop here, but to finish, I would like to maybe uh, share with you some of the uh, Nobel uh, Glantz. So, if you are uh, <laughs> if you are lucky to uh, to um, be part of a discovery like 36 years ago, which was my my case, and maybe uh, uh, perseverant enough to uh, to work on the this subject during 36 years, uh, you end up here in this fantastic uh, ceremony 
um, which is uh, really fantastic, and maybe you would get very happy <laughs> to get um, some diploma from Majesty the King. And maybe you can uh, be part of a Nobel banquet, which is also spectacular. And uh, for a, a French like myself, uh, raised with, uh, you know, a Republic, Republic, Republic uh, think, with my favorite history subject was the French Revolution. <laughs> to <laughs> This, which is true. <laughs> uh, end up uh, talking with the king of Sweden is a kind of experience, uh, and uh, and and um, making a speech was actually a little bit terrifying experience, but uh, it was also uh, fun. And uh, in the following day, we had even a, a dinner at the royal palace, as you see here. And with that, I would like to thank you, and I would like to thank. Uh, uh, many people here, the, this is my research group actually celebrating this uh, Nobel Day uh, in Dalby to, together. And uh, also here is uh, people that have been working with me, um, of course, after Sune and Klaus Joran at the very beginning. But uh, a little bit starting from the order of appearance, Johan, Perl, and Mathieu, Anders, Cord, Marcus, David. And least, plus many others, as you see here. I would like to thank uh, this research has been supported by uh, uh, the, the Swedish Research Council, the uh, European Research Council. European funding has been very important for, for this research in, in general, and, and the Wallenberg Foundation. And of course, I would like to thank the Lunds University and Lunds Techniska School and, and every, every one of you for listening. Thank you. We have received um, a tremendous amount of questions in Mentiam. Uh, we won't have time for all of them, but um, we will absolutely selfishly select in no internal order whatsoever the ones we would like to ask you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is, will you still be teaching us? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a very good answer. You mentioned 36 years. What kept your patience? And how did you know that you were on the right path? Um, you never know you are in the right path. <laughs> um, what kept my patience was uh, I wanted to learn more. Simply, as simple as that. To understand better and, and to learn more, yes. So it's not that I thought I would get a Nobel Prize, absolutely not. And it's not that I, ah, I was convinced I would get at Atosian pulses, no. It was, it was more than, uh, well, I wanted to learn more. I was not finished by uh, studying this process. Perseverance. Thank you. And I, I can add that this is really fun physics. I hope I have conveyed yet to you. It's a, it's a mixture of optics, uh, atomic physics, and uh, nonlinear optics, uh, X-ray optics. Uh, it's, uh, you learn things all the time. It's, it's uh, very nice physics. Yeah. Over to Hörsalen. Natalia, I'm curious to hear which question you picked out of the ones in the stack. Hello, Anne. Uh, thank you from all of us here. Thank you for an amazing lecture. And also, of course, congratulations to our Nobel Prize. And we're thinking, like, the, the subject of physics, it includes a lot. And how come you chose atomic physics? Do you just stumble into it, or do you have a specific memory connected to it? Yes, I am um, teachers. 
that's my answer. I had very, very good teachers in atomic physics. And these are um, Claude Toko and Tanuji, especially, and, and Serge Laroche. Both of them got a Nobel Prize in physics. But later on, uh, they were teachers uh, for me in, in 1980, and this impressed me very much. I liked atomic physics because uh, one could um, one could build the models. It, it was not uh, too complicated, <laughs> and at the same time, I ex also uh, with experiment, which were not too big. Yeah, but teachers okay. are important. Well, it's so lovely that you continue to be a huge role model for all the students here at LTH. And you talked in your lecture about all the people that have helped you to build this like successful uh, Nobel Prize. So what do you think? How do you create a dream team? Is there a key for it? Yes, that's a different. I mean, that's really actually important to uh, create a dream team. And I think my dream team is somewhere here. I don't know, maybe they want to uh, raise them. <laughs> and <laughs> yes. Um, I, I think to, to build a, an, an environment where, where people can express themselves, they, uh, they also can build their own motivation, I think that's very, very important. And we can have a discussion where you know, ideas pop up, uh, that's, uh, that's very important. I don't know, yeah, I, I think I have a fantastic team. And I have had fantastic teams all, all over the time. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Natalia. So let's go to Hörsalen. Marina, what are your uh, questions? Hello from Gasksalen, not Hörsalen. Gasksalen, I'm so sorry. Yes. So I went through the questions and we have got a lot of questions, but I found one question that particularly stood out about inspiring students. So we got a question about what advice do you have for young scientists and students aspiring to make significant contributions to the scientific community as yourself? I don't know. I can't. <laughs> I really can't answer this question. Uh, my advice, uh, I always say, follow your intuition, whatever this means. Mm -hmm. uh, do do what you. Don't think, oh, this could lead to Nobel Prize in 36 years. You can never do that. Think, oh, this is really fascinating, and this is what I want. Even if maybe for others doesn't seem to be, but if it's fascinating to you, then it's a uh, yeah. right decision. We also got another question from another student, I think, about how can I overcome setbacks and potential disappointments throughout my career? How can I deal with that? Um, perseverance. This, this is my <laughs> obstinacy. Or, yeah. And then we have another random question asking, what would you have done if you weren't a scientist instead? Oh, that I know. Teacher. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you so much and congratulations again to your Nobel Prize. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. So another question, Anne. What research equipment is on your wish list for your future work? Yes, we, we were talking this morning about a new, uh, a new oscillator in the, in the, me in the megahertz lab. Yeah, uh, new, yeah, uh, yes, new, new laser, new laser. W what makes this field uh, so, uh, uh, I would like to call it dynamic, is, is not only that, you can think that this research has taken a lot of years to come where it is, and we are not really, uh, apart from this last application I was mentioning, we're still doing basic research a lot. Uh, so we are not into, uh, uh, you know, society, yet. But it has taken a lot of time. You think, oh, this is really boring. Just to solve one question, it take all of these 36 years. Yes, but yes and no. First of all, things have really changed. And for example, laser technology has really progressed. And, and this is also what is research. You need to keep up with uh, including all of this progress in, in your research. So this connect to the question that we need better lasers all the time. So, um, yes, so this could be in my wish list. Yes. <laughs> Very good. And maybe more people as well, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, 
the better conditions for the young people would be very nice. This is my wish list as well. Here is another totally different question. Then. How do your safety glasses protect your eyes from radiation? Uh, they protect them from uh, actually refractions that can, they are big filters, so they protect them from the radiation that could, by mistake, com come towards your, your eyes. So, yes. And what do you consider to be the greatest scientific achievement made in your lifetime? Well, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> I think, obviously, and because this is why, why I got this Nobel Prize, this first experiment where we saw these high harmonics, this was a big... People ask me, was it a eureka moment? It was not at all eureka, because it was not expected. So it was, it was rather, wow, what is that? <laughs> Um, so this was uh, one moment, but there there has been a, a ve a very there has been other moments, and it can also be one thing I could say is a little bit uh, point out the importance to uh, to do theory and experiments at least in a group to have both of that, and I've been also. Uh, uh, moments where, oh, finally we understand how these uh, time delays I was mentioning, how this works. This was also a kind of a nice moments when, when things we don't understand is like a puzzle and then everything come into place and, and finally you understand the, the physics. That's, uh, that is not happening every year, but maybe every three, four years, in, uh, at least for me, in career of a researcher. And it's a, it's a very exciting moment. It's worth a lot. It's worth a lot of uh, disappointments and uh, setbacks. But when you have sometimes this, ah, now I understand, it's really worth it. Yeah. And one final question, Anne. Which is the question about your Nobel Prize that you would like to answer, but you haven't been asked yet? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I've been asked many, many questions. <laughs> so I'm not answering. I am very impressed by all of you coming here to, to listen to me. I, I'm not answering to anything, but this is my uh, spontaneous comment. Well, in that case, I say thank you, Anne. Thank you. Before we end this session, I believe Annika has some final words to say. Please come up. So this was fantastic, uh, as expected. <laughs> uh, really nice to hear about the stories from when it started. Uh, and of course, it was a truck and not a bus, but you brought some uh, instruments here as well. We would really like to thank you for this lecture, Anne. Uh, so, and congratulate you to the prize. Uh, from the Faculty of Engineering, uh, we have a gift as well <laughs> <laughs> to you. Uh, and this is something that I hope um, will make you remember, uh, the Engineering Faculty. Uh, it's uh, not as old as the start of your Nobel Prize discoveries uh, 36 years ago, but it's still from an artist that made some interesting thoughts about engineering and life, engineering and natural science and social science and so forth. And uh, he unfortunately passed away, but at the engineering faculty we own his pieces so we can use it. And I hope this will be something to remember uh, from the faculty. Uh, we, c we can <laughs> take care of it and send it to you. Uh, and I hope nice. it's about nice. nature, technology and mankind. And then we have a small gift, I guess, from the, in, uh, from the <laughs> Faculty of Medicine, because they heard that you missed your t tennis lecture <laughs> when, when the day when everything was announced. So uh, I guess it's some 
tennis balls or something <laughs> that you can you can use. I, I, I just uh, received it from them and should say congratulations from the Faculty of Medicine as well. Thank <laughs> so thank you so much, Anne, and uh, we are really proud of you. You are a role model to all of us, specifically to the young researchers and the students. So thank you so much. And I would like to get Hörsalen and Gasksalen up again, one final time to say thank you so much for joining both remotely and in the different rooms and of course you online as I said so bye bye thank you very much thank you. Thank you.